valued member of the board of the Foundation for the National Archives. Thanks for being here. How could we possibly talk about women in Congress without Nancy Pelosi? We're very pleased and honored to, to welcome her to our stage again tonight. Nancy is a good friend of the National Archives, Democratic leader of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Two New Year's Eve's ago, um, while we were commemorating the signing of the Emancipation Proclam Proclamation, Nancy, on New Year's Eve, my birthday, <laughs> made two visits to the National Archives to see the Emancipation Proclamation. She, she actually called the president and said she was going to be late for a meeting because she had something more important to do <laughs> in the morning. And then at midnight, just before midnight, she showed up with 40 of her closest friends in the house to help us celebrate. Welcome, Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, David, for your warm words, but more especially for your wonderful, wonderful, really, truly great leadership of the archives. It's such a, you're such a treasure uh, to watch over all of our national treasures, our documents of freedom. Thank you, David. It's a working farm. You know, we're always doing things. So my apologies for not being here from the start, uh, but nonetheless, a great honor for me to be here with these great women whom I had the privilege of serving with in in the Congress of the United States. Uh, Connie Morell and I shared our Italian American heritage, so we bonded from day one. Barbara Canelli and I went to Trinity College, so we shared uh, that uh, uh, that devotion, both classes of green. Mary Bono, oh my gosh, well I've known her long before uh, she came to Congress, but to see her as a mom with her young kids, uh, and then see the children grow up. Uh, we're just talking personally now. This is a bit of all the rest. And, uh, and then uh, Blanche Lincoln, and she, she, I saw her, I, I was in awe of her. She was this young woman, then having twins, serving in Congress, becoming a United States Senator, it was such a joy. We were always so very, very proud of her. And then, of course, the course, Senator, you, you're a historic figure. I mean, I know that that is inadequate, but uh, to be the first, how wonderful and what great service you provided to our country. So, so I salute all of you. And Jackie, thank you for being such a wonderful moderator. But I understood because I was listening all the way to some of the things that were being said, and I thought I would share a couple of stories with you, and I know we want to hear more from the audience, but in light of some of the discussion, uh, when I, uh, I, when I first came to Congress, I, who uh, knows, you, you, you don't know what to expect, and so we started having this a dinner group. We'd go out to dinner, it's called Tuesday night, but it could be any night, and uh, Barbara Canelli and Barbara Boxer and I were the three women in the group. You have to remember there were only 21 women out of 435 at that time. So we would go out to dinner and never, nobody ever asked you, what do you think? You know, that, that would be unthinkable. And everybody just spoke at the same time. And, 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 and until one night, and we would sort of laugh among ourselves that you know, they never asked us what we thought and stuff. And uh, then one night, they get on the subject of childbirth. And they're going on and on about, oh, I'll never forget. It. I wore these green things. I the, <laughs> the night I had we had our baby, we had our baby. <laughs> I took the pictures. I have some pictures, but never mind. It was it. And then, oh not me, they didn't let me in. My kids that was before then, my kids I couldn't get in. Who got in the whole time? Who got in for one? Who didn't get in for the other? The whole thing. They're going on and on. So the three of us are looking at each other saying, for surely, they will say. <laughs> Barbara and Boxer having two children, Barbara having four, I having five, 11 children among us. For surely, they might even think, is this an uncomfortable subject for you? <laughs> Never once did it ever occur to them to think, what do you think about childbirth? <laughs> 
so if you think that they think that they know everything. Uh, and so a, a week later, we were having a dinner, and the beautiful Don Edwards, who was the floor leader of the ERA, really a, a liberated gentleman, <laughs> we're talking about something. We said, Nancy, what do you think? Oh my gosh. So I said, I took the occasion to tell them of what happened the week before, and all of the same people who were at the table said, we never would have done that. It didn't happen. See, they didn't even have a clue. <laughs> they don't know more about childbirth than the women at the table. So that was one. Two, um, when I first became in the leadership, I went to the White House for my first meeting as a, as a member of the leadership. Now, I've been to the White House a million times and appropriated challenged one thing and another, so I wasn't intimidated by going at all. At all. I mean, it just was another visit to the White House. And so, I mean, I was excited about the rest, but I didn't, it didn't instill any anxiety. And I went in, opened the door, go into the room, president, vice president, leaders of Congress, House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans, a small table. And then I realized the door slammed behind me that this was a meeting unlike any other meeting I'd ever been at the White House. Unlike any meeting that any woman had ever been to at the White House. Was there as an appointee of the president, however excellent that would be, was there in my own right by dint of the power vested in me in my, of my caucus. So I sat at the table, representative of an equal, an equal branch of government. And just as the president, President Bush, ever gracious, lovely, gracious, President George W. Bush, was welcoming, he said, uh, he said he was welcoming and look forward to hearing from your views. I'm sure they'll be different than some of ours and all that. And very nice. But as he was speaking, I could feel like lots of people sitting in the chair that I was in, just squeezed in. And I thought, what is this? I've never had this feeling before, but it felt like it was all crowded. And all of a sudden, I realized it was Susan B. Anthony and Helen and, uh, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Sir John Truce and Lucretia Mott and Alice Paul. They were all on that chair. Yeah. They were all on that chair. Uh, and uh, Carol, you identified with it. They were all on that chair. And I could hear them say, at last, we have a seat at the table. <laughs> but of course, we all stand on their shoulders and others stand on ours. And that is the responsibility that we have. I heard you talk about, uh, that you were talking about uh, Lindy Boggs and how wonderful she was. I have a million stories about her, but more from you. But just in conclusion, I would just say that one of the things that I wanted to do when we had the majority was to change the look of some of the statues in the um, <laughs> Capitol. And we, won, we had Helen Keller, and one of the first ones that was ready um, was um, Sojourner Truth. And, and we have, now as you know, we have Rosa Parks. We have just a whole more women, more color in the in that capital. But the day that we were dedicating to German truth, that occasion, thousands of uh, really thousands of people came. We were out out through the rotunda we're in the statue in the at Emancipation Hall in the visitor center. And I tell you this because it struck me so. Michelle the president was newly elected. Michelle Obama was there. It was such an honor for all of us. And when she got up to speak, she spoke about Sir German Truth and she said, I know that Sir Jeremy Truth would be so proud to see a woman speaker of the house, to see you, Nancy, as speaker of the house. Mm -hmm. But I can't even imagine what she would think to see me, Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. as the first lady of the country. So beautiful. So much, so much has happened. Well, David began with the president. I'll end with the First Lady. And again, thank you for celebrating Women's History Month with these historic women, one and all. Thank you.
briefly, and it's perfect that the speaker is here. The question was about how do we change primary systems to make a difference. And in California, we now have an open primary system. I think it's sort of a work in progress. I think we're still going to see how it shakes out, but it certainly has made a huge difference in California. So uh, I was just going to talk about the open primary, but perhaps it's good to move on. Uh, the speaker here. You know, there's something we have not mentioned, speaking of primaries, and Nancy was in the same class with me and Martin Lancaster, the 100th Congress, but the fact that we haven't, nobody's mentioned the word gerrymandering. And, and, and I think one of our problems with polarization is the safe seats, the safe districts. These people in the safe districts, all they worry about is who's going to vote in a primary. And they can just get their voter list, and they feel those people voting in primaries are the passionate ones, uh, you know, who care strongly about maybe a single issue. And so that definitely is something that we need to come to grips with. And I know California has changed it, and I like the open primary, but we've got to get people to go vote in primaries. And I think all of you have a responsibility in that regard, too. Uh, people always will say, oh, I vote all the time. But then, but did you vote in the primary? But I vote all the time. <laughs> but you know, but I, I, I was busy. So I'll, I'll vote in the general election. So June or whenever the primary is has become the new November. And so it's really something to Do you think that works against women in particular? Do you yeah. candidates? Sure, because, it, well, I, I can't say specifically. I can't generalize. Um, yeah, I, I can generalize. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think if you're going to get that strong group that care about a single issue, it might not be down to help women who tend to be more, I, I think, uh, I'm going to say more consensus builders and more open-minded, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, not always, but you know, a little bit more. So I do think it does. I think most it hurts, I think it the whole system. The most gerrymandering that goes on to a reapportionment can be characterized as incumbent protection. I mean, it starts off yeah. with that. And one of the things that have been proposed, and I would propose it frankly to both parties, is where you have an open seat, an open seat in a primary, why not nominate women or support women's candidacies for those every open seat a woman seat? What's wrong with that? You're not challenging an incumbent man, which is normally a male given the numbers we have. You're not challenging, and, and, and it would show the party's commitment to supporting of the election of women uh, at that very critical point where it really can make a difference. And so I just put it out there because when we go through our party uh, uh, party caucuses or conventions, having every open seat a woman seat would be The ambassador, the ambassador, good luck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we tried already. We didn't get anywhere with it, but I think, um, I think, I think it's important. Did you want to add something to that? Well, just for a moment, um, I would say, that I agree with Mary that the California system is a work in progress and it's going, in my view, in the wrong direction because it's increasing the role of money in politics. But I, can, I promise and guarantee you this, if you reduce the role of money in politics, increase the level of civility in politics, you will elect more women no to political office. The, uh, we are supporting just a, a bill for a national standards for commission redistricting to take it out of the hands of the legislature. Not that some of them don't do a good job, but the public confidence in the system is really important to us. And if you don't have the public confidence, that's not a good thing for a democracy. So commission redistricting, lower the role of money, we must do it. Our founders, here in the archives, they sacrificed everything for a democracy, a government of the many, not a government of the money. And that, unfortunately, is not good for the democracy. It's certainly not good for electing more women. I'd like to ask you, but I, I do want, you wanted to ask a question from the start, and I will get it to you. If I, I'm just afraid we'll lose Mrs. Pelosi. I just, related to what you've just said, since you're basically the recruiter in chief, for House Democrats. And there's been comments made tonight that Democrats don't have as great a problem, certainly not like Republicans do in terms of recruiting and electing women. Still, if there's no, you're nowhere near close to parity. I'm just wondering, given the climate and given the money, 
whether you're finding it harder to recruit women than you used to when you started in politics. Well, I'm, uh, when I came into Congress and I was there with Barbara, we all determined that we were going to increase our numbers. Imagine, remember, uh, Connie, 435 members of Congress, probably a similar size of this room, 23 women. Over 400 men, 23 women. And since that time, we went from 12 Democratic women to 63. We more than five times, uh, increased it by five. But that's still not enough. And again, you have, uh, we're playing on an old playing field in the, a, an environment of a previous era. We have to make our own environment. And that is to, again, increase and empower the voices of, of the many over the money. But to more precisely uh, to your question, uh, our recruit, we just rolled out our top 16 candidates. 10 of them are women. And they're top-notch, first-rate, fabulous, talented public servants who happen to be women. And, and our caucus, as a result of what we tried to do, our caucus, the House Democratic Caucus, is over 50% women, minorities, and LGBT community members. Beautifully diverse. The beauty is in the mix. And that, it's a decision, though. It's a decision that you go out and do it. I agree with Barbara. It would be hard to convince everyone to do that. But we have to take every opportunity uh, we get to elect women because nothing is more wholesome, in my view, to the political process, the increased participation and empowerment of women. Hi. So I don't think it's harder. What makes it harder, <laughs> what makes it harder, when they say it back to me, I could never put my family through what you have been put through in terms of $100 million spent to take down a person, I think because I'm effective, says she immodestly. But the fact is, that's the main objection that people, women are courageous. They know their power. They know they have a contribution to make. They know it's unique in every case. And what they might have a thick skin about themselves, putting themselves on the line, is drastically affected as to what they want to put their children, their grandchildren, if, if that's the case, their family, their parents through in terms of the mischaracterizations of that will happen. That's why I say reduce money, increase civility. Uh, but again, it's not for the faint part, this running for office. Women know it, and we're so pleased that just in the first 16, and many more to come, because we'll have probably uh, 50 challengers, but we're off to a 60% start in our, in our numbers. The she begins to ask her question. Hi. One of the ads run against me was criticizing me for bringing my children to Washington with me. That I was a bad, I was a, a bad senator because I chose to go to my children's parent-teacher conferences and their soccer games and their piano recital and have them close by me um, as I served. So you're right. You gotta be careful. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon. I'd like to ask Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi and the panelists how challenging it is to pass pro-women legislation and. Um, what are your major accomplishments as, um, as women representatives or senators that uh, bills you passed or supported during your time? I already mentioned Violence Against Women Act, Office of Research on Women's Health, a commission to look at more, getting more women into math, science, engineering. I had Bill Nye, the science guy, here before the science committee when I was there. And I said, I said, Mr. Nye, this is great. You really inspire young people. I said, don't you think you need Kate Sell, the technology gal? And, and he agreed. And family and medical leave. So there are a number of others, and even looking at foreign assistance. And so maybe the others can comment on it too. But I think we were able to accomplish a great deal, right, Nancy? Yeah. Anybody else? Child nutrition. Um, yes, of course. Pepper. For the first time in, since 1974, we increased the reimbursement for school feeding programs. Um, when I passed up uh, both out of my committee and on the floor by unanimous consent in the Senate in 2010. Nothing has to be considered but creating that collaboration to be able to do things uh, for children um, and families is, is equally as important to women, for sure. Yeah. 
No, I just want to. Oh, thank you. Uh, just, just jump in here because now this is going to be a little bit of an ideological debate here. Uh, and I don't really want to go there. But, you know, we all agree that there are problems and agree what the problems are. We don't always agree in the solutions, and hence the two party system. But for me, you know, as a supporter of Violence Against Women Act and a whole number of other issues, uh, but at the same time, I'm one of the people who constantly questions whether the federal government is the right place for many of these answers. And are, are they the people that I think have the best way of, of handling my children? Do I want them in charge of my children's ed education? So I think it's sometimes, you know, it's a partisan fight, but do I have to stand up and offer why, you know, I supported the, the uh, federal bill for X when I actually believe the best way to, to solve a problem might be to empower the locals to do it? or to empower families to do it. So it's a little bit of a, of a debate um, there, but I would have to say, you know, every woman doing this, back to the question about television programs, whether it's a strong role model on, on television or in any artistic form, or whether it's a politician or a speaker of the house, regardless of, of even ideological feelings. You know, I, my daughter is, I don't know if she's a Republican or Democrat, I don't think she knows. But I know that she, and she knows that Nancy Pelosi worked very hard to defeat me. And I think that Nancy and I would say, but that's, that was our job. And I think we respected each other as women and as warriors and not to treat each other as equals and as co-equals. But I know that my daughter looks up to Nancy Pelosi very much, and she believes that she can do anything because Nancy Pelosi did. And for that, I thank her for her leadership. So. Logical, I do have to take issue because there are a number of things that the federal government only can do that affect women. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the Senate, you know, and even at, in the Finance Committee, one of the things equalizing the, the way that women are treated with pensions. The pension, mm -hmm. the, the federal systems treated women different, the women pensioners differently than they did for men. And when we fix that, that was a fix that could only happen at the national level. I mean, we can go down the education, all the different permutations of the issue, but the fact is that having women in the room makes a difference, whether it's the mammogram issue in terms of health care, uh, women uh, clinical trials, and we can go without going through the litany wherever the young lady went of the bills that I'm most proud of, and I've got, there are a number of bills. Like I said, I thought I was going to be, I, I thought I was there to be a workforce and pass legislation, which is what I did when I was in the Senate. A lot of those things benefited women. There were things having to do with African Americans, protecting the Underground Railroad, for example, or authorizing uh, protection of the Underground Railroad. So, so having women in these rooms makes a huge difference because it makes it, it broadens the conversation, it expands the consideration, and it helps to uh, to, to to make the policy making more closely resemble reality as opposed to just the sound bites and the, and the, and the, and the political posturing that I think all too often goes on. Yeah, but there is huge abundance of research that shows that when women do get to Congress, they do introduce legislation that concerns women and children. Huge amount of, of absolute proof of that. So I just still stand by that all of us, in any way we can, have to insist that we help encourage women to run for Congress because it will make a difference for our families and it's particularly now uh, for our older people. The program said it would end at 830 but we're going to quickly try to get through the questions of those people who are standing right now. So if anyone needs to leave, obviously you've been free to start to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Please, we'll, um, I'll Thank give you, you a question. Uh, predictions for 2014. Will there be a net increase in the number of women in Congress? If so, we make our own environment. We won't, this incrementalism is really, I'm getting very impatient with it. I think we just have to kick open the door and just say it's going to be different. And, and that we're, uh, the views of women, I, I think the way young boys are raised now, families are raised, seeing their moms working, their sisters being trained as professionals or, or working outside the home, people think in a different way about women and leadership. But the fact is still of that in order for women. In Congress, you want people with options. You don't want people without <coughs> options. So you see a young woman who's talented and gifted in terms of intellect or idealism or both or whatever. She has plenty of options. And you're saying to her, you have a beautiful reputation. 
the comfort of your family, uh, the prospects for the future, comfortable in terms of uh, remuneration, perhaps, but in any event, your decision. Or you can put yourself in the hot seat where they will boil boiling oil over you <laughs> all the time, peel your skin off as if it's far from a tree. Your neighbors will cross the street when they see you coming because <laughs> they thought they knew you differently. And so that's not a good thing. So if we're going to have the talent that we need in the Congress, and you see it on display here, you have to have more women say, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to be uh, to be strong apart to do this, but I'm not willing uh, to have my whole reputation undermined for a political point. Now, I just want to go back to something, uh, some of the things that were said. Yes, women go and they obviously care so much, know so much about issues that relate to families, women, and children. But every issue, of course, is a women's issue, and all of these women made their mark in our national security, our national economy, and measuring the strength of our country in military might, but also in terms of uh, the health and well-being of the American people. It's not to just talk about women's issues, however strong we are in those. So in answer to your question, not in a political way. We would hope that this would have nothing to do with the elections, that it would be resolved before. But we have put forth, when women succeed, America succeeds. That may sound like a slogan to you. It is a statement of absolute fact. When women succeed, America succeeds. So we want to hope to work in a bipartisan way to raise the minimum wage, have pay equity. By April 1st, women who are working next to an equally qualified man will have worked the first three months for free. Because by and large, you will make 77 cents on the dollar. That's just not right. So pay equity and raise the minimum wage of 60% of the people who are getting minimum wage are women. Paid sick leave, and important at every level, at every level, income level, and the rest of our male colleagues say to me, I spent more time off from work caring for a sick parent than I ever did for a sick child. Because it's, it's expensive and it's, it's what parents want. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, the issue of child care, which we really have to address in a bipartisan uh, and a comprehensive way. So for us, elections are about the debate. Uh, we hope that these issues would all be resolved as immigration as well before the election. But I do know when we elect more women to Congress, we will have more pay equity, we will have more family work balance, and we will have, and that includes child care, because women know. And, and just listening to Blanche talk about being criticized for having work-home balance and having the strength and inspiration of our family, our family, because really, how could you do the job if you, if you did not? I just want to say something, though, about what Mary said. Since the beginning of time, right, David? Since the beginning of our country, <laughs> beginning of our country, the debate in American politics and government has been about the role of government. So this is the most legitimate debate, an intellectual debate, about the role of government. And that's the one most of us went here to engage in, to try to find solutions with the right balance, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, never none, and never all. But, but, uh, but that is, I think that our founders would be very proud of the statement that Mary made in that regard. And that is the challenge that we love to have instead of being at, at the mercy of the politics of personal destruction and who wants to that's a, it's enough sacrifice involved already, right? Without uh, going to the next step. In any event, Sue was just saying to me, this is a very important, these kinds of co conversations are very important. Thank you, Sue, for your family's contribution to making all of this uh, possible. And I yield back the balance of the day. <laughs> what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. And then there's two ways to get there. You're either going to leadership track or you go to committee track. And you're right. Uh, Barbara McCulkey does an amazing job. But you also look at Patty Murray. Um, you know, Patty's in leadership, and she's remarkable because she gets into these meetings, and they all just have meltdowns, and she's the only adult in the room. <laughs> I mean, they call her being a kindergarten teacher, but, you know, she is the adult in the room, 
that says, okay, look, oh, we know there's different, you know, she calms everybody down, she brings everybody kind of back to the center and say, okay, what, what, what are we here to do? Um, but, you know, women can do a tremendous job in the leadership um, or on the committee route. Uh, you just have to figure which one that you're best suited for. Um, I chose the committee route and, and um, loved serving on energy and commerce um, and then on the finance committee and, and ultimately being chair of the Ag Committee. But, um, there's, you do have to figure out what you want to accomplish and, and what's the best way for you to get there. Mary, what well, did you see in the, I'm sorry, oh, here, uh, among House Republicans, because it has, there haven't been very many uh, female Republican leaders in the House since. So glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what everybody is saying here, and there's even more to it. And even if you're, if you're going the leadership route, I mean, it, first of all, this is all leadership. But if you're going the, you know, inside the volume, the leadership route to be speaker of the house or whatever, that's one. But to become a committee chairman, it's equally competitive. And back to Carol's point earlier, a lot of this also involves your ability to raise money um, for your colleagues and for the party. And it becomes a huge part of your job. And all of us can say that we've spent countless hours walking from the office buildings over to the, the D trip or the NRCC to make phone calls. And that becomes a huge part of your ability to sort of rise up the uh, leadership ladder. So, but you know, it's, it's uh, they're pioneering women on both sides, whether it's the, you know, Speaker House or the Committee Chairmanship side. But sadly, the Republican Party has to do a much, much better job. And I have to tell you, it's not that the guys don't try, it's just they don't really think about it. And there have been times, even with Back to Violence Against Women Act, we've had debates on the floor where we've tried to sort of shove the guys out of the way to put one of our few women out front. And the guys are saying, no, 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 this is my bill. This is my opportunity to shine. And they've never understood that sitting down for a moment, letting a woman shine would help them too. Mm -hmm. So we've been really trying to make a lot of strides in this and help educate the Republican men why it is in their best interest to help women. But it, it's been a much tougher. We used to laugh, and Connie, you were still there, the women, Democrat women were doing these things, we called them the conga lines. Do you remember that? Yeah. If there was a bill on the floor, but there wasn't enough floor time for the debate, the Democrats would line up every single woman, <laughs> and they would come to the podium, and they'd make a quick little parliamentary speech, you know, I revise and expect to my remarks, I agree the gentleman, whatever, so they had the face time. And it was almost like this women were like, you know that old thing that get it in one door of the little, you know, into the little VW and then out the other side and go back around and around and around. <laughs> and that's how it felt, because there were so many Democrat women. Yeah. And we Republican women, we can get four of us in, in a row to do <laughs> such a thing. But they're brilliant like that. And uh, sometimes we have to sort of throttle our, our guys to say this is helpful for you too. But it's immensely competitive um, on all sides, so. Carol? Well, just to say that I've had, I've been first in a lot of things along the way. The first woman to run for and win a seat in the Senate from Illinois. The first, the first African-American Democrat ever elected. Uh, first uh, uh, a woman on finance. First, 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 first. But I always saw myself as a workhorse not a show horse. And I think maybe that was kind of the, I mean, I wanted to be a legislator. Uh, that was what I was passionate about doing. And so whether it was uh, rebuilding crumbling schools or, or dealing with pensions for elderly women or uh, on the finance or health care issues, I mean, that's where I really wanted to engage. But because of all this history of first, there were expectations that I would be more of a show horse than I was comfortable being. And so, you, how do you define leadership in that situation? I gotten out there and opened up the doors for African Americans to, to serve, for, for women. When, when I won the primary in Illinois, and I'm not just, you know, this is not a pat on the back, but just historical. Um, when I won the Illinois primary, because our primary is early in the season, it gave every other woman running across the country a bounce, in some cases as much as 20% in the polling, in their races. So everybody got a bounce, and, and again, that gave rise, I think, to the year of the woman. Um, uh, and so, you know, having having done that, the leadership came as a result of my uh, doing what I could do to serve. I mean, I it, it, it's often referenced that I ran because of Anita Hill and what happened with the uh, confirmation of Justice Thomas. But really, for me, it was as much about for me, it was as much about Thurgood Marshall and his legacy and his uh, contributions. 
as anything else. And so I was running, making what I thought was a Thurgood Marshall point. The world saw it as another kind of point, but that's okay. Um, you know, and so that's been kind of the, um, for me, uh, in, in terms of leadership. I will never be able to be, not because of anything I think or what I feel, or I will feel, but just because of what I am. I will never be able to be leadership in terms of playing the game. It just won't happen for me. Um, uh, I learned that fairly early. But I also learned that if you do it, if you if you if you if you're fair and and, and, and and honorable and you try to do the right thing, that people will come to respect that, and that has a currency that has a, a, a of its own, and that then parlays into your ability to be effective. I'll never forget your great moment on the floor moments with Jesse Helms. Oh. <laughs> okay, can I tell the whole story? <laughs> <laughs> the whole story, okay? The whole story. Okay, I actually got along very well with Orrin Hatch, okay? But I got, Joe Biden had asked me to go on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm a lawyer, but I didn't want to be on Senate Judiciary, and I told him, I said, you know, the fact is judiciary committees are, you know, fighting over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen or things people will never agree about. So I don't want to be on that committee. I want to do well, he said, oh, no, no, you've got to be on this committee. And I, okay, fine. So I'm on the Judiciary Committee. That day, Orrin Hatch takes up the issue of abortion and starts making the analogy that, that abortion was like slavery. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the debate, that's kind of a familiar theme. And so he, so I'm sitting there going, ah! <laughs> 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 abortion is slavery, what? So I'm, I'm a baby senator. I mean, I was new. And so I'm sitting there, oh my, you know, here's this giant of the Senate. How am I going to? So I'm literally in a in debate with Orrin Hatch about choice. When my staffer comes in and hands me a note and says, Jesse Helms is just taken to the floor to revive the patent for the Confederate flag, I thought I'd already killed that. <laughs> I, mean, I thought I already killed that, that, that amendment in committee. Somebody's running around in the back. So. <laughs> uh, uh, the ghost of Jesse The ghost of Jesse <laughs> Or as I like to say, proof positive the good die young, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm going, why is this happening to me today? This is just not right. So I would get up out of my chair from the committee, from, from judiciary, go across to the Capitol, and there, you know, he's holding forth. Now, wait, I thought I'd already won the battle on the Confederate, and he's holding forth on why this patent should be renewed for the Confederate flag. So we get to this debate, and I lose. I lost the first, the, the first time I lost the vote. And then that's when I said I was going to filibuster. So I wouldn't give up control of the floor. I began to do a filibuster on that point, and that's when people, again, like my mentor, who was Paul Simon, who was wonderful to me, Paul Simon came out, and Ted Kennedy came out, and then, and it actually turned when, um, uh, oh, what was the senator from 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 um, um, Alabama? Oh, how quickly did you forget? Hal 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 Heflin was the critical vote. Mm -hmm. Hal Heflin got up and made the point. He said, "My great grandfather was a general in the Confederate Army, and it's time for us to move past on this past this on this issue." And when he took that position, the votes just started to pile on, and that's when I won. Uh, won the vote and the Confederate flag did not get the patent that Mr. Mm -hmm. Helms, Senator Helms was trying to get for it. Uh, but it was one of those days when you go home and you say, okay, did I really sign up for all of this? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, to close, to close this panel's discussion, it, it's the kind of thing that if you weren't there exactly. as a black senator, that wouldn't have happened. It would have gone through unchallenged, just as many of these issues Violence Against Women Act, you know, no offense to Joe Biden, who loves and earned credit for that. that if these things, so many issues I've seen would not have been uh, conceived of, and all alone cast. And, and on the Finance Committee, and I think that Ms. Blanche did a big point, I sat on the Finance Committee during one of the healthcare debates, and they were going to put a 20% tax on mammograms. And it was like the life, I, I, said, I said, guys, you know, you may not need to get them, but you really want to tax women's health like this. You've got constituents who, when they find out what you've done here, you know, will be beside themselves. Well, you can almost hear the pop, 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 pop. The light bulb's going off like, pop, 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 p
mothers and their sisters and their children and their daughters and their wives, it just didn't register until right. you said, okay, do you need one? No, but I do. <laughs> so, so it makes a difference. Having women, having, having diversity in our Congress makes a difference and perfects our democracy. I mean, that's the most succinct way I think I can play it. I'm pausing because I'm getting voices in my head. Uh, so, uh, Nancy Pelosi, I'm happy to report, is on her way, uh, but we have a few minutes, and so I was going to open to questions from uh, people, uh, any of you out there, and um, just know that you might get, you know, the hook at any moment. Uh, yours is the first hand I saw. Would you? Yes. Um, well, I was just.